uh, IT Insurance Group, the former head of security for Citrix ShareFile. Um, Citrix ShareFile was a startup that was founded here in, in Raleigh, North Carolina by Jesse Lipson, uh, was acquired by Citrix. Um, when we started there, it was uh, basically an SMB uh, program, uh, or SMB product rather, and we went from relatively unknown SMB to um, the, the, the leader in the magic quadrant in less than four years. Uh, and then of course I joined IT Insurance Group where I started the security program there uh, in response to the New York uh, DFS uh, passing their cybersecurity regulation. Um, and then you know, after five years of doing that, I decided that I wanted to do something different. I wanted to uh, uh, come over to the, to, the, to the dark side, if you will, um, the, the pre-sales and, and, and service delivery uh, side of things. So um, I appreciate uh, you know, the, the opportunity to speak. You know, so thank you, Carlos, uh, Craig, um, William. Uh, for the opportunity to speak to the to the Fayetteville Fort Bragg ISSA membership. Uh, as we discussed, I'm an active member of the ISSA myself, and I have been a member of the ISSA for you know 15 years now. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Raleigh ISSA chapter, and I'm responsible to coordinate the executive leadership track for the uh, chapter's annual information security conference, um, Triangle InfoSecCon. Uh, so few organizations serve the uh, information security community more than the ISSA, and a, a strong chapter is key to enabling the, uh, the next generation of information security practitioners. So today, I'm going to provide you with an overview of the um, yeah, me, of the Amazon um, Web Services security reference architecture. And uh, I want to emphasize that this session is not intended to be a master class on the AWS SRA, but really an introduction uh, to a key area of cloud security that will benefit anyone, regardless of whether you uh, know AWS or not, right? Uh, so last, uh, highlighting, I, I want to highlight that you know, this presentation does not reflect the most recent changes to the AWS security reference architecture. Uh, so if I have any you know, AWS, um, engineers out there, you might want to call me out on that. I, I just haven't had time to update it. It will be updated, though, um, for the talk at Triangle InfoSecCon. Concepts remain the same. Uh, the message remains the same. I think, really, the, the fundamental difference is that, you know, AWS may have renamed some services. Um, they may have introduced some additional services. I want to emphasize that in the chat, in the very first message, there is a Dropbox link. That Dropbox link has two resources. One is the Security Hub integrations, right? That document um, lists all the secure third-party tools and AWS services that integrate with Security Hub and the type of integration. Does it send data? Does it receive data? Does it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, always reference the AWS site, marketing site for the most recent integrations. Um, and then of course, the second one, which is the more important one, is a um, description of the services that we're going to be covering today. I'm not going to go into each service uh, in specifics, right, or, or in detail. Um, so do, if you have a question about what a service does, reference that uh, handout so that uh, uh, you get a better understanding of that service um, uh, overall. So um, we'll cover a lot of ground today and, and focus our attention on some very important concepts applicable to the AWS uh, security reference architecture, uh, as well as the organizational structure of the reference architecture and their corresponding accounts. And you'll, that'll become a little bit more clear in a minute. We'll highlight the AWS security foundations, uh, including the AWS cloud adoption framework, the AWS well architected framework, and the AWS shared responsibility model. Uh, we'll also cover some important concepts regarding identity and access management, and then of course the multi-account strategy within the context of the AWS security reference architecture. So the AWS uh, security reference architecture is a living document and a set of guidelines. It is not prescriptive. Uh, use it as a reference to implement the SRA as a narrative to adopt aspects of the SRA that are relevant to you and, and obviously to your organization, right?
So the AWS SRA aligns with the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework, uh, the AWS Well Architected Framework, and the AWS Shared Responsibility Model. The, the Cloud Adoption and Well Architected Frameworks propose a set of, of security perspectives and design principles that we'll cover um, at a high level you know, next. So the security perspectives of the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework helps you achieve traditional confidentiality, integrity, and availability goals of your, of your data and cloud workloads. We'll define workloads in a few slides. It consists of the nine capabilities uh, that you see on the screen here. These perspectives ought to be familiar enough to you uh, as they are basic ten tenets of a, of a healthy, you know, sustainable information security program. Everything from security governance to incident response. The, uh, so where the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework um, perspectives frame the overall security strategy, the well-architected principles describe where to start with an emphasis on, on four things, uh, or at least four categorical things, identity and access management, monitoring, detection, and response, automation using infrastructure as code, and then protection of data in transit and at rest. This is a diagram that, that may be familiar to a lot of you uh, if you've explored AWS um, and reflects the AWS, that, that AWS is a, is a responsibility, or rather, that AWS is responsible for security of the cloud while the customer is responsible for security in the cloud. In other words, AWS is responsible for protecting uh, the infrastructure that runs on the, uh, all the services offered in, in the AWS cloud, while the customer, formerly the tenant, is responsible to secure and monitor the systems, uh, the applications, uh, the code, and the data that runs in the cloud, other than those characterized as serverless, right? So generally speaking, serverless is, is a cloud-native development model that, that allows developers and engineers to build and run applications without having to manage the underlying operating system. The only thing they're responsible to do is manage and run the code. So my, I, went to, I went to camp with my kid this year and they have a, a thing. The teacher says, hey, 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 and the students say, listen up, listen up. So hey, 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 listen up, listen up. These are some important concepts to understand if you're gonna peel this onion, okay? Uh, in fact, this and the next slide are key to understanding the security reference architecture and what it's trying to accomplish. So AWS organizations enable you to configure AWS services that apply to all accounts, right? For example, and we'll discuss this in a few, you can configure centralized logging using a logging account uh, that leverages CloudTrail to collect event logs for all accounts. Again, more on this later. So grouping accounts into so-called organizational units enables you to attach a policy, a policy-based control to an organizational unit. Uh, you do this so that you can account, uh, so that all accounts within the OU automatically inherit that policy, right? Does that sound familiar? Sort of like Active Directory. Keep in mind that by default, no access is allowed between accounts, right? Access must be explicitly configured or granted, and uh, you, you really ought to um, organize workloads into uh, separate accounts, right? You, this is going to be a recurring theme. I'll probably repeat it two or three more times. Um, you do that so that you can um, enforce security, compliance, uh, access, and billing boundaries um, granularly and categorically, right? We'll talk about that in a few. I can't emphasize enough that, that or segmenting rather your, your workloads with, um, will make it much easier to categorically or granularly apply security compliance and access requirements as well as help you determine the cost of running a workload uh, to facilitate budgeting, um, chargebacks. Maybe you want to understand, you know, how much a project uh, is costing or how much a workload is costing in production or how much, you know, a workload is, is costing in, in any environment, a lower environment, like a non-production environment, right? Uh, some important concepts here uh, regarding identity and access management. So remember that IAM principles uh, can do nothing in AWS. 
uh, until you grant them permissions, right? Um, the default configuration supports uh, what we call service control policies as deny lists, right? Uh, to deny specific services and actions. So the reason this is, is because deny statements in AWS are shorter, uh, they're easier to maintain and can be applied conditionally, right? As opposed to allow lists, which really can become cumbersome and introduce a lot of overhead as you, as you manage what is allowed and what isn't. So you can use uh, this, uh, this uh, concept called trusted access. Uh, to grant um, the CloudTrail service trusted access to create an organizational trail uh, in all accounts managed by the AWS organization. So the, S the AWS SRA uh, delegates administration of security related services to the security tooling account, uh, which we'll discuss later. But in this particular case, you can grant that organizational account, um, that organizational trail account or, or login account rather, uh, trusted access to all accounts in order to create that organizational trail and collect those event logs. So delegating administration of a service is as easy as typing the account ID of the account uh, to which you want to delegate administration from within the AWS console uh, configuration page. Um, and that configuration page is associated with the service that you want to delegate. Uh, AWS Control Tower is important. It's been introduced within the last, you know, nine months. Uh, it automates the setup of your so-called landing zone based on best practices, blueprints. It applies guardrails and automates account provisioning, right? So remember this, a landing zone is simply a well-architected multi-account AWS environment that is that is really the starting point from which you can deploy workloads. So it's really what we're describing today. Behind the, 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 the engine or the concept behind this um, multi-account strategy. So now we'll discuss uh, the organizational units and corresponding accounts. Remember, this is a guideline only, not meant to be prescriptive, and many organizations do rely on third-party commercial off-the-shelf or open source solutions and tools um, that they ought to account for and integrate um, uh, to customize their approach. In fact, I provided you a list of all the third party solutions that integrate with Security Hub and the type of integration it supports. So please, uh, please reference the AWS marketing site uh, for the latest integrations. Um, but that list is good as of uh, earlier this month, August 7th. So the management account, um, it hosts the root of the AWS organization. It is the most important account. This is where you apply those service control policies we talked about to ensure that member accounts stay within like the account governance structure and the access control guidelines, right? Remember that service control policies don't grant permissions. The only, the only affect, uh, the only affected rather, member accounts uh, they only affect member accounts, rather, uh, not the management account itself. So when you apply a service uh, control policy, it impacts other accounts, not the member account, uh, or not the management account. The management account hosts the CloudTrail organization trail that we briefly discussed earlier. And all events associated with event logs are stored in one S3 bucket. So system manager, is an agent-based service, and among other things, you can use it to patch your EC2 instances, right? Your EC2 instances are basically your virtual machines. Amazon SSO, which I think has been renamed in the new um, uh, SRA uh, guideline, can serve as your identity source and enable federation uh, to not just the member accounts, but also other applications, other services, right? A lot of organizations use Okta or some other, you know, single sign-on solution, uh, but uh, it, you can also leverage SSO, AWS SSO to do the same. AWS Config enables you to audit the configuration state of your resources, of your AWS um, account, uh, uh, against the desired state configuration. It'll tell you, you know, if you have, a, you know, S3 buckets are publicly exposed. It'll tell you if you're over-provisioned and, and it, with regard to permissions, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, a little more detail into uh, identity and access management, you can leverage what they call IAM Access Advisor, and that provides um, 
the service last access information, right? Uh, so that you can use uh, use to audit. You can use that to audit and manage permissions over time. So essentially, it performs some degree of cloud infrastructure entitlement management. Right, so you can identify whether a resource has too many permissions, the last time it used a specific permission, uh, the extent to which uh, you, you can um, uh, basically uh, modify those permissions to um, limit uh, access, right? And so it does help with things like periodic um, access control reviews. Moving on here to the security organizational unit. Uh, which contains the security tooling and log archive accounts. So the security tooling account uh, serves as the admin account for centralized security services, right? It's designed to enforce guardrails and enable monitoring and response for all member accounts, all member accounts, right? So it's a centralized account. This is where your security analysts operate. And you can have more than one uh, security uh, tooling account if you want. Uh, Security Hub is designed to ingest data from uh, all the sources, right? Uh, again, reference that sheet. It'll tell you everything that, that Security Hub can ingest. Um, and it does so to assess, enrich, prioritize security alerts and posture across accounts, right? Uh, security Hub integrates with um, AWS services like GuardDuty, Macy, uh, Detective, Inspector, Firewall Manager, Access Analyzer, AWS Config, uh, System Manager, uh, Patch Manager, and more. Uh, use, use, you can use CloudWatch rules uh, to send uh, findings from uh, Security Hub uh, to your third-party SIM, Security Information Event Management Solution, from Security Hub, right? So you can, it's not just a situation where Security Hub might ingest information from your SIM, but also, it, it's prim uh, the, the primary use case is to actually send information to your SIM, recognizing that your SIM remains a central uh, um, platform uh, to do security monitoring and triage. Uh, you can also rely on EventBridge and Lambda to automate response and remediation uh, activity to introduce the capability to perform some degree of security orchestration uh, and automated response, SOAR, right? Uh, keep in mind that Detective um, relies on machine learning and visualization to generate a so-called unified interactive view of behavior and interaction of uh, and between your resources, right? Detective can ingest guard duty findings, uh, but ensure guard duty is running for 48 hours uh, before you enable it. Uh, otherwise, you won't see the capability uh, to, to actually enable Detective. So the log archive account ingests and archives all security related logs and backups into one S3 bucket uh, with the capability to ensure immutability. Uh, immutability obviously is the, the, the capability to actually change those logs. Uh, durability, integrity, and confidentiality are also key attributes. Durability is used to measure the likelihood of data loss, um, and S3 is designed to provide 11 nines of durability, right? And four nines of availability. Uh, so 99.99% uptime uh, of, of objects over a given year. Remember that S3 is object storage, not block storage, right? So think of an object as a file, right? Logs are, are, are archived to ensure confidentiality using S3 server-side encryption. Uh, and CloudTrail provides log file integrity validation to ensure that uh, the integrity of your logs. The primary log source, uh, the log sources that are included uh, with CloudTrail are VPC flow logs, CloudFront distribution, and AWS WAF access logs, and Route 53 DNS logs. Uh, you can also ingest operational logs as well as application and database logs, so you know access logs. Um, it's always a good idea to enable uh, MFA delete, multi-factor authentication delete on an S3 bucket uh, to protect against accidental or even malicious deletion. And then always consider storing older log files, anything older than 90 days in cheaper storage options such as AWS Glacier. Couple more things. Um, also limit the IAM policy labeled AWS cloud underscore full access. So again, that IAM policy is called AWS CloudTrail 
underscore full access. Limit this policy to as few individuals as possible because uh, as the policy label indicates, uh, it gives the principal, right, the, the identity, uh, full access to CloudTrail to make any modifications that they want, right, even delete CloudTrail. Um, rely on AWS config to monitor the configuration state of the S3 bucket to make sure it's not publicly exposed and IAM access analyzer to monitor access, right? You can see who's been, who's accessed uh, CloudTrail, uh, who's accessed that S3 bucket um, from an IAM perspective. Um, you're going to observe a recurring theme in that security service guardrails are deployed with appropriate delegated administration to the security tooling account, right? as opposed to hosting that, that responsibility within the account itself. Um, that prevents any of the member accounts uh, to have, you know, uh, um, privileged access over any service that's running within the security tooling account or the login account. And this ensures uh, a consistent, you know, set of guardrails across your AWS organization as well. All right, so now transitioning over to the infrastructure OU, uh, which contains the network and shared services account. There is some security value in these accounts, uh, so they are important as well. Um, the network account manages the gateway between your applications and the broader internet, right? Whatever workload you're hosting uh, in, in each of those accounts that we'll talk about separately. Um, the inbound VPC uh, on the top left there uh, host reverse proxies, right, such as load balancers, application delivery controllers, while the outbound VPC can host forward proxies, so web proxies, URL filters, proxies, sorry. Uh, both can perform network address translation. Flow logs associated with uh, both VPCs uh, end up in the uh, log archive account that we just talked about, right? The inspection VPC uh, can host firewalls as well as intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. Uh, you can rely on the route 50, on route 53 to handle DNS, right? Um, CloudFront to act as your content delivery network, uh, certificate manager to manage your TLS certificates and, and keys throughout their lifecycle. Um, keep in mind though that certificates provision uh, through certificate manager can be deployed you know, using route 53. So AWS WAF, uh, is an application firewall that monitors HTTP and HTTPS, so 80 traditionally and, and, and 443 traditionally, uh, and, re and request to any uh, CloudFront distribution, any application uh, load balancer, uh, any API gateway, any REST API, any GraphQL API. Um, AWS Shield offers standard uh, distributed denial of service, protection at no cost with an option to enable Shield Advanced uh, to protect the Route 53 resources, as well as applications running on protected services such as CloudFront distributions, EC2 instances, or any, any workload sitting behind an application load balancer or elastic load balancer. I do caution you though to understand the costs associated with enabling Shield Advanced because it can run into the thousands. All right, the shared services account supports the services that applications and teams rely on, such as uh, directory, metadata, and messaging services. Uh, Systems Manager, which we briefly discussed earlier, uh, enables you, uh, enabled in the management account um, and application workload accounts, enables you to monitor, manage, and update in scope resources, right? So you can patch resources um, and that sort of thing. Uh, there exists the option to integrate your self-managed or AWS-managed Active Directory service within AWS SSO. And then you can grant Active Directory users and groups access to AWS accounts, applications, or both. Again, I want to emphasize it's not just a single sign-on for the account itself, but also for applications, um, software as a service applications, for example. You can also connect uh, AWS directory services with self-managed uh, AD services. Um, note that um, AWS directory services lets you run uh, Microsoft Active Directory as a managed service too, uh, as a convenience. So the workload OU 
contains one account per production workload um, to enable, again, remember the recurring theme, the security, compliance, access, and billing boundaries that we discussed earlier. Those billing, those boundaries rather uh, are important so that you don't need to apply the same level of security uh, or compliance safeguards controls uh, to every account, right? So an application account hosts the primary infrastructure and services associated with a, with a specific workload. A workload can be an application, a backend system, a front-end system, doesn't matter. Uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to cover the details of this specific workload, but I do want to mention a couple things about it. Uh, so if you look there right in the middle, you're going to see these endpoints. You see AWS KMS endpoint, system manager endpoint, Amazon S3 endpoint. Those endpoints connect your application VPC to other AWS services, right? The benefit of using these endpoints is that they allow communication between instances in your VPC and other AWS services without forcing that traffic over the internet, right? Uh, and they also let you configure IAM resource policies to, to more granularly, granularly rather control VPC endpoint access and authorization. But the primary benefit um, is that it allows communication between those instances that it's interfacing with um, in that VPC and other AWS services without route, routing that traffic over the internet, keeps it internal. Uh, however, uh, always consider creating a, a separate account for each workload uh, to establish boundaries. Um, Design again, and this is the recurring theme, delegate access and authorization controls to admins and engineers granularly apply categorical or granular security and compliance safeguards and controls, and then accurately allocate AWS costs to departments or projects. Ultimately, if you deploy an AWS environment, finance is gonna ask you, right? What is this costing? You know, who, how much does this project cost? How much does this workload cost? Um, how do we budget? How do we uh, forecast for a specific project within AWS, right? Uh, and this is your way of doing that by 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 ensuring that you um, segregate, that you segment these workloads into the into separate accounts. By the way, not every workload or environment needs to deploy every single security service. Um, and creating separate accounts for each workload allows again allows you to categorically apply security and compliance monitoring and safeguards, differentiating between, for example, HIPAA, uh, PCI, and scope workloads. Uh, or any other regulatory or, or standards-based requirement as well. Uh, so um, this is a use case that I want to talk about, and we're nearing the end here. I want to emphasize that the following information is not or is public domain, right? It's on YouTube, uh, and not subject to our NDA with uh, Caesars Entertainment, right? Uh, AWS sponsors a video series called This Is My Architecture. If you have not um, watched some of those videos, please do. Um, there is no faster way to learn AWS uh, uh, within the context of specific use cases than uh, through these This Is My Architecture um, videos. Uh, so This Is My Ar Architecture is where AWS partners with customers to highlight security st uh, case studies, right? Or rather, case studies, generally speaking, not necessarily security case studies, just case studies. And for a, uh, for a year, I was the interim head of security for the Caesar Sportsbook. Uh, Caesars Entertainment acquired William Hill and rebranded it Caesar Sportsbook. Um, before the acquisition, William Hill partnered with uh, AWS to produce a, a video case study that is posted again on YouTube. Uh, so on or about November 1st, 2016, uh, William Hill and now Caesar Sportsbook was a target of, of a distributed denial of service attack that leveraged the Mirai botnet, um, which at its peak of 177 gigabytes per second overwhelmed William Hill's online service, uh, rendering them unavailable for a period of time, right? In response, William Hill decided uh, to migrate their on-prem service, uh, services, which all of William Hill was on-premise at that point, to AWS to leverage AWS Shield Advanced and AWS WAF and really to take advantage of the extensibility of the elasticity of AWS, right? Um, 
And to protect against these distributed denial of service and, and web application attacks, like, such as credential stuffing. So William Hill supplements AWS Shield Advanced and AWS WAF uh, with a third-party solution to ensure additional coverage and observability. However, the, the consensus within the industry uh, is that AWS WAF is enterprise ready and has really reached a state of feature parity with third-party solutions like F5. Uh, to begin with, um, all Sportsbook request traffic, you know, starting on the top left here, is handled by AWS CloudFront, right, relying on AWS Shield Advanced and AWS WAF to mitigate Layer 3 and Layer 4 uh, DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, such as SIN floods, as well as application layer, layer attacks, such as HTTP floods. Um, because they subscribe to AWS Shield Advanced, they get AWS WAF at no additional cost. So even though you're enabling AWS Shield Advanced, and there is a cost associated with that, you are getting AWS WAF at no additional cost. Um, with AWS Shield Advanced, uh, you also get right, uh, you also, you can also write customized AWS WAF rules to mitigate more sophisticated application layer attacks, and uh, you get to deploy them immediately too. Um, they can, you can also set up rules proactively to automatically block bad traffic, um, or respond to incidents as they occur. Um, they have so so when you subscribe to AWS Shield Advanced, you have at your disposal 24/7 access to the AWS Shield Response Team, the SRT team, uh, that can assist with incident response, going as far as writing rules on your behalf uh, to mitigate application layer DDoS attacks as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with things like regex. Uh, next, they route the traffic to, to Route 53, right? Um, going down to the lower left of that of that diagram now. So again, it hits the WAF, hits Advanced Shield, goes to CloudFront because remember, CloudFront is the content delivery network, and then it, it's going to um, Route 53, the AW, AWS DNS service, and within Route 53, they have two separate Route 53 hosted zones. One's for non-sensitive data, um, uh, destined for an ELB, and the other for sensor traffic destined for an EC2 instance, which hosts the, the big five, or the, the F5 rather, uh, big IP WAF, F5 big IP WAF, as an added layer of protection um, that supplements the AWS WAF. And then the ELB and the EC2 instance are hosted within dedicated accounts. And right, um, I'm just to the right of the eight, uh, Route 53 icon in that VPC that's hosting that ELB, uh, and then the EC2 instance that hosts uh, F5 WAF. Um, once the traffic traverses the ELB uh, or is evaluated by the F5 WAF within their DDoS mitigation service, the traffic is routed to one of several AWS accounts via VPC peering, right? VPC peering is just a way to connect to, uh, uh, two VPCs. Uh, where in, and within those VPCs are certain services that are hosted. I can't talk about those services. Any traffic destined for application services hosted on premises is routed to co-location data centers over the AWS Direct Connect, which is a way to connect AWS to your on-premise data centers. Um, and then of course, for an added layer of protection, they can send, send CloudFront standard and real-time logs that contain detailed information about every user request that CloudFront receives, right? Uh, standard logs in AWS parlance are also known as, as access logs in real-time logs. These logs uh, provide them with the detailed information about requests made to CloudFront distributions in real time. Um, literally, logs are delivered within seconds after they receive the request. Um, they also rely on real-time logs to monitor, analyze, and respond to security incidents. Um, they forward these logs uh, to an S3 bucket, right? I'm um, up in the top right now, right? Where you see S3, Lambda, and DynamoDB. They forward these logs to the S3 bucket where they await aggregation and parsing by their SIM, their security information event management solution. Any offending IP address uh, or addresses are then automatically stored in that DynamoDB uh, table uh, or database, right? On the, on the top right, uh, it's a NoSQL uh, database along with an expiration date to accommodate for things like eph the ephemeral nature of an IP address. Um, meaning uh, IP address can be here today, gone tomorrow, used by a service, and then tomorrow it's not. 
Um, then they're acted upon by a serverless Lambda function that queries at the DynamoDB table that hosts all these IPs, identifies new and unique offending IP addresses, and then writes them to, uh, to a dynamic AWS WAF block list, right? So again, what it's doing, it's looking for unique IP addresses that are not already written uh, to AWS WAF, to that block list, um, pulls that IP address and then writes it to the WAF and then null routes that, that IP address for a period of time, right? Null route, black hole, whatever you wanna, whatever uh, terminology you wanna use, right? Um, again, uh, this happens, um, this cycle happens continuously, iteratively, uh, and again, all this information is available to you um, on, on YouTube. So um, the GitHub, the AWS GitHub repo, the repository, uh, contains the, the cloud formation templates necessary to deploy all or parts of the AWS security reference architecture. Um, I'll leave it up to you to go dig into the SRA. Uh, but everything that you saw um, here today in those diagrams can be deployed programmatically through cloud formation templates. Cloud formation uh, is just a way to de deploy infrastructure as code, right? Instead of going into the console and manually clicking around to create everything that you saw, um, the scripts, um, these templates, um, uh, automate uh, the, the instantiation of these accounts, these services, uh, through our infrastructure as code um, that is available to you here. So some useful references here. Um, so uh, if you want to learn more about AWS, you want to learn more about the uh, security architecture of AWS, um, please reference these, uh, these, these references, these, these documents. Um, keep in mind that these concepts and the approach uh, is applicable really to any cloud environment, regardless of the service provider, right? Um, obviously, AWS has done a lot of work over the years to, um, uh, you know, lead the pack, if you will. But the other, AW, uh, other cloud services, you know, GCP and uh, Azure um, do uh, give AWS a run for their money in different, um, in different categories. And so please do evaluate um, your your use case, right, to determine which cloud service provider is, is best for you. We focus on AWS primarily, however, we support customers with uh, that host uh, GCP and Azure as well. A little bit about uh, Align Technology Group. Um, so we're headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. We are a gold sponsor at Triangle InfoSecon. Um, and uh, we, we definitely do our part to support the community. Uh, one of the reasons I do these talks is, is not just to you know, advertise on behalf of the Line Technology Group, but to educate and form. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, we're a technology reseller. Uh, we sell hardware, software, um, but we're also a consulting firm uh, with a very strong focus on you know, cloud and security. Uh, if you have additional questions uh, or need assistance, then you know feel free to reach out to me or any of the folks that are listed on the uh, slide here uh, through LinkedIn. We also have a website um, uh, that it, it, with a with a contact us you know page as well. That said, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and uh, take questions if you have any. This isn't really a question, but definitely want to say thanks for kind of putting into like an architecture perspective. Um, definitely just recently learned about a lot of the AWS services from one of my SANS courses. So it's interesting to see it kind of all put together instead of all the, you know, individual pieces and services by themselves. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, I, I think that this document is um, probably one of the most important documents that AWS has um, published. Uh, look, it's not an easy document to read. It's going to take you uh, a couple, two or three reads to get through it. Um, you know, some of those concepts that I described, you know, those IAM concepts and, and the uh, multi-account strategy concepts um, so are, are a little challenging to, to digest, but um, give, give it time. And, and yeah, definitely, this is one of those uh, documents that really puts things into perspective. Thank you for that. 
Any other questions? Hit them with the hard questions, y'all. The uh, I don't see the um, chat. Let me pull the chat. Let me stop sharing and pull the chat. Anybody have any problems downloading the the two resources? If you if you do decide, I'll add this. If you do decide to read the security reference architecture, uh, familiarize yourself at least with the AWS service descriptions, and that way, when you're reading the um, what the SRA document, uh, things make a little bit better sense. Um, otherwise, you're you're going to find yourself stopping trying to look up what a service does. Um, it's not so important on the first read that you really focus on what each service does, more so uh, that it is a multi-account strategy. Uh, there is a concept of a landing zone. Uh, again, if, if you don't take anything away from this talk, uh, take away the fact that you do want to separate your workloads into separate accounts um, so that you can uh, apply those security and compliance controls and safeguards categorically or granularly, you want to make sure that you can answer um, questions around what a specific workload costs the organization so that you can help those organizations, those sponsoring functional areas like marketing and uh, whoever else to, to, to forecast, you know, what it's going to cost them. Also, it helps you identify who the big spenders are, right? Um, and that way you can ask them to dial back if they're, you know, consuming, you know, more resources than necessary. It's a lot easier to analyze one account as opposed to the whole account when you're trying to uh, identify where you're, you're spending most of your, your dollars. Especially, you know, I hear a lot of folks who say, well, oh, it's expensive to go to AWS. Um, it can be, I, I, you know, in, sp in particular use cases, especially when you just lift and shift. If you're just lifting and shifting, you're not doing your job, you know? Uh, yeah, I think sometimes it's necessary to do that and you don't have a choice, but take the time to refactor your code. Take the time to refactor your infrastructure, right? Your platform, um, leveraging uh, native services where possible to reduce costs, because obviously once you start introducing third-party services, whether they're security services, whether they're non-security services, at that point, uh, costs begin to elevate. Right, people start to ask questions, right? But you know, it's all, almost always easier to turn on a service, a security service within AWS that already integrates uh, with other services within AWS, Security Hub being the hub, um, than it is to go ask for money to purchase, you know, yet another solution. You can do vulnerability management within um, within AWS. You can do uh, threat intelligence uh, within AWS. Uh, you can do some degree of event logging. Uh, you can obviously do event logging within AWS, but then obviously you want you need some tool to be able to. Um, and Security Hub, you know, can be that tool, but sometimes you want at least one third-party tool like a SIM to do that um, that triage, right? That, that monitoring and triage. Uh, yeah, I'm going to provide my Prezo to, um, to Carlos, and he will provide it uh, uh, to you guys. I, I don't know how that happens, Carlos. Is that a link that you provide, or is it on the website? The uh, your presentation. Yeah, we probably post it on on the the website, or we'll okay. share it on Slack. Sounds good. We we probably yeah. want to just be stingy with it and make you come to Slack and talk to us there. there you <laughs> go. And uh, you know, I don't mind if you post it ahead of Triangle and Fosicon, not a big deal. I, I've given this talk at the Las Vegas ISSA already. Um, they posted it. Um, but again, if you want a second dose of this, come to Triangle and Fosicon. I think my talk, uh, I'm on track one, I think, um, somewhere around the 2.30, 3.30 time slot. I forget which one it is. Any other questions, guys? Gals. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You let me off easy. Thanks, Manny. Thank yeah, no worries. Thank you very Thank much, you. Manny. We appreciate it. Thanks, Manny. Yep. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.
All right. Well, that does conclude our meeting. Uh, again, if you guys have any more questions, uh, if you guys want to follow up with us, if you have any ideas as far as what you'd like to.